Hallelujah. Happy Lord's Day. I pray that as we worship God on this blessed day of the Lord, that God will continue to bless us and be with us. Today in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5, we read, Test yourselves to see if you are in the faith. Examine yourselves. The Apostle Paul continues to tell us and remind us that we are in the faith of Jesus Christ. We are saved to go to heaven. And we are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. And that's why we need to test ourselves to see if we have faith. And whether our faith is alive and whether our faith is real. But in today's verse, Apostle Paul says, Test yourselves to see if you're in the faith. This definite article, the, is added, emphasizing that this is not just any kind of faith, but this is a specific faith that he is speaking about. So we need to ask ourselves, am I in the faith? In order to answer that question, we need to understand what the faith is. What's that faith that Apostle Paul is speaking about? And Jesus spoke about the faith also. So today, let us think about the faith and ask ourselves, are we in the faith? So first point, what is the faith? What is the faith? In the Bible, this faith, the faith, appears in several different places. But first, it speaks about the faith of the early church. Acts chapter 3, verse 16. I'll read for you. Acts chapter 3, verse 16. And on the basis of faith in His name, it is the name of Jesus which has strengthened this man whom you see and know. And the faith which comes through Him has given Him this perfect health in the presence of you all. So it is the faith in Jesus Christ, the faith in His name. And Acts chapter 16, verse 5, it says, So the churches were being strengthened in the faith and were increasing in number daily. This is the faith, the faith in Jesus' name, right? And the churches were being strengthened in the faith. During that time, there were many different kinds of faiths. Different kinds of religions and beliefs. And the Jews believed in God. Just like the Christians. Back then the believers of Jesus. And so there were different kinds of faiths. And different types of faith. And here in the early church. They're referring to the faith. As though that is the only real faith. The faith in Jesus Christ differentiating from all the other beliefs and all the other thoughts and faiths. And so this faith, the faith, is the faith in Jesus Christ. And this faith is the only faith, the only true faith that will lead us to salvation and sanctification and eventually to the kingdom of heaven. Secondly, is the faith that Apostle Paul speaks about. Apostle Paul, a zealous person who had faith, who had faith in the law, who had faith in the God of the Old Testament. And so he was zealous in persecuting Christians according to his faith. But later after he met Jesus on the way to Damascus, he calls this faith that he found in Jesus Christ, the faith. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 13. Be on the alert. Stand firm in the faith. Act like men. Be strong. And there are many other Bible passages where he refers to the faith. But let us look at a couple more verses that Apostle Paul spoke about. Galatians chapter 1, verse 23. Chapter 1, verse 23 says, But only they kept hearing... He who once persecuted us is now preaching the faith which he once tried to destroy. This is speaking about Apostle Paul, right? Who tried to destroy Christians, believers of Jesus. The faith that he once tried to destroy, that faith in Jesus Christ, he's referring to 
that faith as the faith. Chapter 3, verse 23. But before faith came, we were kept in custody under the law, being shut up to the faith which was later to be revealed. So when it says before faith came, and it's referring to Jesus' coming. And when Jesus came, the faith was revealed. But before faith came, we were kept in custody under the law, being shut up to the faith, which was later to be revealed. And that faith was revealed to the Apostle Paul and is being revealed to us. It is that one specific faith, none other. And therefore, we might say, I have faith. But we have to ask ourselves, do I have the faith? Just because I believe in God does not necessarily mean that I have the faith in Jesus Christ. The faith that Jesus is looking for. The faith, this faith cannot be attained by our own strength or will. This is the faith that God wants to see in us. There's no fake. The faith is talking about that one real faith that God gives to us as a gift, as grace. And therefore, any other will become fake. It's not the faith. And, that, and this is the faith that Jesus will look for. It's like the code. It's like, it's like the secret thing that we have, that we can recognize each other. When Jesus comes again, Jesus said, I will be looking for that faith. In Luke chapter 18, verse 8, I'll read it for you. Luke chapter 18, verse 8, it says, I tell you that He will bring about justice for them quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will He find faith? This is the English version. And literally, in Greek, Jesus is saying, when the Son of Man comes, Jesus is referring to Himself when He comes again, when He returns. Will He find the faith? Literally, on the earth. And third... The faith is referring to the faith of Abraham, according to Apostle Paul. Romans chapter 4, verses 11 through 16, but I will read verses 11 and 12. And he received a sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith, which he had while uncircumcised, so that he might be the father of all who believe without being circumcised, that righteousness might be credited to them. And the father of circumcision to those who not only are of the circumcision, but who also follow the steps of the faith of our father Abraham, which he had while uncircumcised. So Abraham, before he was circumcised, which was in Genesis chapter 17, Abraham already believed and he was reckoned righteous by God for believing and for his faith. And later he received circumcision. Romans chapter 4 verse 17. It says, As it is written, A father of many nations have I made you, in the presence of him whom he believed, even God, who gives life to the dead and calls into being that which does not exist. See, Abraham believed before circum even before circumcision. He's, he had faith in God when God promised him, your, your children will be as many as the stars in the sky. He believed and God saw that faith and reckoned it as righteousness. Later he was circumcised. So faith comes first. And that faith led into and grew to Genesis chapter 22 where Abraham sacrificed Isaac believing 100% that God would raise him up even if he killed him. And this was Abraham's faith. The faith that responded to God's calling. The faith that followed, continued to follow God. The faith that grew and the faith that matured. The faith that came to know God more intimately. And that faith is considered by God, reckoned by God as righteous. 
And therefore, his circumcision did not make him righteous, but it was his faith that made him righteous and qualified him to be circumcised. We should understand this order properly. It's not that outward mark or action that makes us righteous. It is this faith that makes us righteous. It is this faith that makes us Christian. Calling ourselves Christians, being baptized, doing all these things, these outward things are not the things that make us righteous. It is the faith that God, that God reckons as righteousness. And as a result, we can be called Christians. As a result, we can be baptized. As a result, we can do God's work. Even if we lose everything in this world, I pray that you may not lose that faith, the faith. Because it's that faith that will lead us to God. It's that faith that will allow us to overcome all the tribulations. It's that faith that will lead us into the kingdom of heaven and receive eternal life. It's that faith that allowed Abraham to sacrifice Isaac in obedience to God, although God stopped him. It's that faith that allowed Abraham to be called friend of God. Do you have the faith? Do you have that faith that can lead you and allow you to obey God, even if he were to tell you to sacrifice your Isaac? If we don't have that faith, that will allow us to joyfully obey God's word, no matter what it is. True faith will lead us to obedience. But first, it will lead us to understand God's will. And through faith, we come to confirmation, assurance of the will. And so that will of God becomes my will. That direction and vision of God, purpose of God becomes my purpose. And therefore, that obedience will not be a difficult thing. And therefore, that obedience will become a joyful thing, a thankful thing. Of course, there are times when God forces us. God tells us to do the thing that we just don't want to do for the sake of saving us, training us, or many other different purposes and reasons. But this sacrificing of Isaac, I believe that God led Abraham to a point, to a point of faith where Abraham really understood God. And he had no doubt that this was the will of God. And there was no other way, no other option for him than to follow. That is faith. It is not... Just because I suck it up and I just, you know, bite my teeth and do it. Although my heart doesn't follow. Although my heart doesn't really understand. That will not make us righteous. So how do we attain the faith? How is this faith attained? First, faith comes from knowing. But there are different kinds of knowings. And I'm going to share about two different kinds of knowings in a negative sense. And from there we will learn what true learn knowing is. First is knowing according to the flesh. So we need to know God and know the word according to the spirit, not only according to the flesh. And that knowing will lead us to the faith. Apostle Paul has never met Jesus personally in physical form. Apostle Paul met Jesus only after Jesus ascended up to heaven. But he met him spiritually. But Apostle Paul confesses in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 16. 2 Corinthians 5, 16. Therefore, from now on, we recognize no one according to the flesh. Recognize to come to know no one according to the flesh. Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him in this way no longer. See, Apostle Paul came to know, hear about Jesus, that he was born in Bethlehem, and so on. According to the flesh, all the information 
All the claims. He knew Jesus according to the flesh before. That's why he did not understand the truth and persecuted him and believers of Jesus. See, there's no one who does not know Jesus right now in the fleshly way, according to the flesh. Even Herod knew Jesus, that Jesus was born in Bethlehem, and that that was, the, the, the fact that Jesus was going to be born in Bethlehem was prophesied in the Old Testament through Micah. When he was born, Herod knew the place and the time. That doesn't mean he believed in him. There is probably no one, not many in this world in today's time, that does not know about Jesus, that has not heard about Jesus. And most people that know about Jesus probably know that Jesus was crucified also. However, that is knowing him according to the flesh. Because even though they know who he is, they know his name, they know what he has done. They do not believe in him. There is no faith. It is, it is the knowledge according to the spirit. Yada and Ginosko knowledge. Coming to know him through relationship. Coming to understand and experience the living God, Jesus Christ. That's when we come to receive that faith. Secondly, there is the knowing that is separated from faith. Knowing and believing are separated and two different things. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 13, Apostle Paul again says, Until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. In order for us to reach to the maturity of the fullness of Christ, our faith and knowledge of the Son of God, Jesus, have to come together, have to be united. That's what Apostle Paul is saying. The true knowledge will lead us to faith. See, Romans chapter 10 verse 17 tells us, faith comes from hearing the word. Hearing the word, when we hear and understand, that, it, that becomes knowledge. right? And that knowledge of God, who Jesus is, according to John chapter 17 verse 3, knowing God our Father and the one whom He has sent, our Lord Jesus Christ will give us eternal life. And so knowing will lead to faith, believing, and that will lead us to eternal life. But many times and cases, knowing and believing, knowing and faith stay separated. What we hear at church and how we live in the world, are they the same? What we believe and know to be the right thing versus what we do, are they the same? See, faith is found in our life, not in our head, not only on Sundays. The faith is something that hits the road, something that is carried out through our hands and feet and our lives. We study the Bible a lot. Why do you study the Bible a lot? Why do you like to study the Word? So that we can boast? So that our heads can become big? Or is it so we can come to know God? So that we can believe in Him better? So that we can enter into the Kingdom of Heaven? But we hear the Word of God, we study the Word, and we, if we don't live accordingly, that means we don't believe it. That remains as knowledge. If that what we have heard, what we have learned, does not go into, melt into our heart and carry out into our actions in our life, it remains as knowledge. And that would be a great waste. What happens when our knowledge and faith are separated and stay separated? Romans chapter 1 verses 21 and the following, but I will read verse 21 only. For even though they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks. See, if we know God properly, first thing we need to do, the first things that will happen in our lives, first honor God, glorify Him, and give thanks to Him. But it says, even though they knew God, they did not honor Him as God 
or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened. They became futile, and they have become darkened. That's the result of not carrying, not the knowledge not becoming faith. The faith and knowledge not becoming united. One example is, remember when Goliath, the Philistines, were threatening the Israelite army. And David heard about this. Little boy David heard about this. And he came to the, to the field of war and battle. And this is what he said. 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 26. Then David spoke to the men who were standing by him, saying, What will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should taunt the armies of the living God? See, nobody else was able to even do anything. They were so frightened by the Philistine army and, and Goliath. But this little boy David comes and says, How blasphemy! How dare this uncircumcised Philistine taunt the armies of the living God. And so, uh, to make the story short, he comes, he, and he goes to King Saul, and he receives permission, and he cannot put on the armor, so he puts it, puts it aside. He comes and stands before Goliath. Chapter 17, verses 45 through 47. Then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword, a spear, and a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have taunted. This day the Lord will deliver you up, to, up into my hands, and I will strike you down and remove your head from you. And I will give the dead bodies of the army of the Philistines this day to the birds of the sky and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, and that all this assembly may know that the Lord does not deliver by sword or by spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and He will give you into our hands. This little boy David, he just spoke what is right according to what he has learned. What the Bible tells us. What the Word tells us. And he says he has experience of God's help before. With the lions and bears and wild animals. When he was shepherding. There were many smarter people. People who were able to fight better. Wise people. People who knew the Word of God. The law of God. But nobody was doing anything. Why? Because their knowledge about God being with Israel, God protecting Israel, was separated from their faith. They're not, they knew a lot, but there it, was, it did not become their faith. For David, he may not have known so much according to the teachings of the law, but the little that he knew, that knowledge became faith through his experience. And he completely believed that God will protect. Whether he lives or dies, it did not matter. For the others, what mattered, just like the 12, uh, 10 spies that spied out the land of Canaan, what really mattered was their own life, their own safety, their own, own well-being first. That's why the Word of God did not become faith in them. But for David, God was first. The glory of God was first. And so that word, that knowledge was faith in David. Who is that Goliath in our life? What is that Goliath in our life? What is paralyzing our faith today? These people of faith stood in front of Goliath and they were paralyzed. They could not do anything. Their faith was paralyzed. But David did not let Goliath Paralyze his faith. See, when knowledge, the Word of God becomes faith in us, that's when miracles take place. That's when God will start His work. God's work will take place in our life. 
There are contradictions in our faith. What we think and believe versus what we actually do and how we live our life. When these contradictions, when we overcome these contradictions, when we are able to find true faith, that's when we will experience God's amazing, miraculous work. So I pray that this knowledge of the Word of God will become faith in you and me, in us. That this faith will become faith like David's, faith like Abraham's, faith like Apostle Paul's. The faith that will lead our life. The faith that will guide us to the path of righteousness. Secondly, faith comes from grace. We cannot buy faith with money. We cannot attain faith with our strength. Faith comes only through the grace of God. It's only by God's grace. And therefore, we need to receive God's grace and the blessing of Jesus' blood on the cross. We need to understand we need that, that sacrifice of Jesus, atoning work of Jesus on that cross needs to really come and touch us. And that's the gospel. We need to believe in the gospel in order for us to have faith. Are you touched? Is the blood of Jesus still effective? Is it still really alive in our lives? Or is it just a story? Just the same thing that we hear every time at church. How precious, how important is the blood of Jesus? Is it just some knowledge? Is it just some old story? Or is it still, still giving you hope and motivation and reason to live? For example, let's say you needed some money. Don't have anything. All spent and lost. And so you try to go to the bank for a loan. It didn't work. Try to go to the friends. It doesn't work. So you come to the parents. The parents don't, you know that the parents don't really have much money either. But you tell them the story, your story, that how much you need that urgent, or how urgently you need that money. And, and the parent, the mother, sees the child going back, discouraged. And so after the child leaves, the mother goes to all the friends and all the places that she can, begging, please, please let me borrow this money. I'll pay back in certain time. I'll pay back. She is ill-treated, and she is given all kinds of mistreatment. She has to go through all these things. But she makes that money. She, she borrows that money. And she calls the child. Son, daughter, this is the money I prepared for you. So take it. What would you do with that money? What would you do with that money? You know that the mother has to pay back that money. You know how she got that money for you. How would you spend that money now? You cannot even compare this to what Jesus has done to us. But at least this might be something that you might be able to relate to. There might be a child who says, Oh, there's another money, another, whenever I need money, my mother will do something about it, so I go spend it. Will you do that? Or will you be the child that will say, this is the money that my mother got for me through her tears and blood. It's her blood money. And so I will spend it carefully and I will, I will make more and pay her back multiple times, many times over. So she doesn't have to go bow down and beg those people again because of me. At least, at least, we need to have that kind of heart towards what Jesus has done for us. Because we were about to fall into the fire of hell. And Jesus, at that last moment, saved us out of that hell fire and gave us another chance. However, many people are deceived by cheap grace in this age. We are deceived 
because of our likes for convenience, laziness, and compromises. And we seek for that cheap grace. Sometimes caused by sermons that grant forgiveness without repentance. Baptizing those who are not qualified without honest confession. Communion without confession of faith and repentance. See, communion is a very heavy and important thing because we are sharing the body of Jesus Christ. Although it's symbolic, we are thinking about the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. We are participating in the, the last, like, kind of like the last supper of Jesus when He gave His bread and wine, His body and blood. At times, people become too casual about taking that. Without confession, without repentant heart. And so, the body of Jesus, the sacrifice of Jesus becomes cheap. Declaration of forgiveness without, understand, without having the people understand or accept that they are sinners. Without personal confession, without realizing how deep and grave their sins are, leading them to misunderstand. I pray that our church, at least, will not do that. People like to, of course, people like to hear that they are forgiven, that they are okay. But what, how would you like to go to a doctor when your body is dying of cancer and the doctor says, it's okay. You just take these vitamins and you go on. It's okay. You're forgiven. You're healed and cured. The misunderstanding that we don't need to repent anymore because we are already saved. That we can just live our lives overemphasis on salvation and confidence without any foundation. That confidence that they will not go to hell. Who says? Who decides? Even when they have sinned, just saying that you are forgiven, you're okay. And that's why the world mistrusts and looks down upon Christians. They are saying, you guys live the same way we do. You do the same things we do. The only thing is, you go to church on Sunday, and after that you feel comfortable thinking that you're forgiven. Of course, when we repent, we are forgiven. But what they're saying is, you don't change. We don't change. Many people don't change. They continue to commit that sin, but they just go to church and think that it's washed for that week. When the woman who was caught in the middle of adultery was brought to Jesus, Jesus forgave her. Jesus sent those people, accusers, away. And Jesus asked her, Are they condemning you? She said, No. And He said, I do not condemn you either. That does not mean Jesus is saying, you, what you did is okay. Jesus is not saying adultery is okay. If Jesus did, from that point on, adultery should be okay for everybody. Jesus says, I do not condemn you either. Go, but from now on, sin no more. He forgives her, not the sin. And we have to realize that. We might be forgiven, but we must not return to that sin. Salvation is not only about my personal assurance. God needs to recognize it. God needs to give it. God, it says, God reckoned that Abraham was righteous. God needs to see that faith. But if we have that if we don't have the faith that God is looking for, and we think that we are saved, we think that we are forgiven, we need to think again. Do I really believe in Jesus and what He did on the cross? And does that really give us grace? That grace is so powerful that it changes our life around. That causes us to repent. That causes us to follow Jesus. Is that grace in you? And that, it's that grace that leads us to faith. So we need to ask ourselves, 
Am I really living in the grace of Christ today? Is it just the talk, my knowledge, my thinking, my emotion? Think about my direction of life, my purpose. Where do I spend a lot of time in? What's the priority in our life? Jesus said in John chapter 3, verse 5, you need to be born again through spirit and water, through water and spirit. We need to be born again, meaning we need to be changed. We need to become a different person. My old self cannot continue on to go into the kingdom of heaven. I need to be renewed. I need to be regenerated. Mark chapter 10, verse 17, I shared a couple weeks ago during dawn, the young rich ruler that came to seek for eternal life. And he did everything. He sought for eternal life. He had the deeds. He followed the law. He kept the Ten Commandments. But Jesus said, you lack one thing. We need to ask ourselves, what is that one thing that I lack? And I pray that you and I may be able to come back to that grace. May we receive that grace. Grace is not just when I do something wrong and I'm forgiven. Grace is not just when I need something and God gives it, gives it to me. It's not something that meets my convenience, that takes away my guilty feeling. Grace is salvation. Grace is Jesus coming to be with us, although we are sinners. Grace is what changes our life. So as a third main point, what the faith is not. We often, and many people may mistake these things to be confirmation of faith. Faith comes from knowledge, proper knowledge. Faith comes from grace. But this is what faith is not. First, faith is not probability. It's not a percentage. Meaning, we don't gamble with faith. It's not a chance. Faith is 100%. Faith is not praying something, praying for something and saying, uh, maybe not. See, Abraham believed 100%. That's why he was, he did not hesitate even 1% in sacrificing Isaac. David believed 100%. Of course, of course, we might ask for something and God may not answer that because maybe that's not God's will. Faith is believing that God will do His will, fulfill His purpose, and that God is good. Secondly, faith is not emotion. It's not something that is higher today and low tomorrow. It's not something that depends on my environment. When things are well, I give thanks. Some, I say something that is of faith. When things go bad, I complain and ask questions. Faith is not my assurance either, as I mentioned earlier. Just because I say I believe, just because I think I have faith, it doesn't mean. God needs to recognize it. Is it the faith that God recognizes? When Abraham sacrificed Isaac, God told, told him to stop. But God said, now I know that you fear me. I see your faith. And the number of years we attended church or believed in God doesn't equate to our faith. We cannot judge our faith through our actions. But true faith does show through our actions and words. So as conclusion... True faith, this, the faith, is referring to the faith of Jesus Christ. The faith of Jesus Christ needs to come into me. How does that happen? In order for the faith of Jesus to be in me, we need to really understand and receive the grace of the cross. Romans chapter 3, verses 21 and 22. Romans 3, 21 and 22. But now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, 
even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe, for there is no distinction. This faith in Jesus Christ. See, righteousness of God comes through faith in Jesus Christ. This is true. It is right. Faith, we need to have faith in Jesus Christ. But literally, in the original text, Greek, it says, Righteousness of God through faith of Jesus Christ. Faith of Jesus Christ. And so, we need to have that faith for those who believe. Needs to have, need to have that faith of Jesus Christ in us. It is not our faith. Jesus believed for us. Jesus died for us. On behalf of us. And so when we really believe and receive the grace of the cross of Jesus' crucifixion, then that grace, that faith comes into us. When we bear that cross, just as Jesus told us, that's when this faith comes into us. And that's why Apostle Paul said in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. Apostle Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer that I who live. He is saying, I don't exist anymore. But Christ lives in me. And therefore that faith of Christ is in me. In today's passage, 2 Corinthians chapter 13 verse 5. I'll read it again. Test yourselves to see if you are in the faith. What faith? The faith of Jesus Christ. Are you in that faith? Examine yourselves. Or do you not recognize this about yourselves? That Jesus Christ is in you. See, the, he's speaking about the faith of Jesus Christ. And he's saying that faith, Jesus is in you. Unless indeed you fail the test. In order for us to pass that test of faith, Jesus needs to be in us. We learn this when we are baptized, when we first become Christian. We learn that it is not I who live, but Jesus lives in me. You all learned that, right? When you were baptized, when you became Christian. Does Jesus still live in you? Is it the faith of Jesus that is in you that leads you? Or is it your faith? Or some other faith? Somebody else's faith? Back in the days when Russia used to be Soviet Union... There, were, there was a pastor who uh, had underground church. And people in secret ca gathered and received the gospel. Received the, the message of Jesus Christ and the cross. And there were people who wanted to be baptized. And they are determined. They make the decision. I want, to, I want to be baptized. And I want to be Christian. Live as Christian. As children of God. So they go through the catechisms, the questions, the life that lives according to Jesus, the life where Jesus is in me and I no longer live. They confessed, promised. This is something that we have gone through and we have confessed. And then that pastor, at the end, at the baptism ceremony, asked this question. There might be a spy amongst us in this gathering. If there is, he will report the list of those who are baptized to the authorities. And once that happens, you might end up in prison. Extreme cases, you might have to die and be tortured. You will definitely be fired from your work, outcasted, and your children will be kicked out of their school. Your parents may be taken away. If, if your children get married, they will be divorced and they will be kicked out. 
do you still want to be baptized? And these people who are standing up to be baptized, most of them sit down crying, give it up. Only a few standing up with tears. They are baptized to be taught and become witnesses to go and evangelize. Nowadays, not only baptism, even people who get into theology want to become pastors. They become pastors more easily than these people being baptized. Faith is not an easy thing. That's why Jesus is asking us, are you able to be crucified? Are you able to take on that cross? Then the faith is in you. That cross, taking up that cross, is taking up the faith. Peter asked Jesus to avoid that cross, but Jesus told Peter, you should take up that cross. Are you ready to take up that cross? And further, the cross that you are carrying, you think you are carrying today, is that the cross of Jesus? Or is that just the cross, that, just the hardship that results from my own lackings? Jesus took up the cross not for himself, not because of his own problems. Jesus took up the cross for his enemies. Jesus took up the cross for the sinners. Are we able to take up that kind of cross? In today's passage, Apostle Paul asked us, examine yourselves to see if you're in the faith. Mark chapter 8, verse 34, as the last passage. And he summoned the crowds with his disciples and said to them, if, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. And that faith will lead us to the kingdom of heaven. That faith will give us blessings. But that faith is not just any kind of faith. I pray that you and I will receive, will have the faith in Christ Jesus. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, what an amazing grace and love, the blood of Jesus Christ, which is sufficient for all of us. Because you saved us from falling into the fire of hell. But oftentimes we forget. We only ask for more and more. Father, help us to understand and receive that grace one more time. May that first love be rekindled. And may our faith become the true faith. The faith that you are looking for. Our Father, allow us to repent. Allow our faith not just to be a label. But may it be true faith in us. That will lead us to your path into the light of your glory. Father, we ask for nothing else today but for that grace. Help us to be in the faith. Thank you so much for your grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us give thanks to God.